So Bob is going on a date tonight. He needs to pick a shirt, a tie, and a pair of pants. He has six shirts, two ties, and four pairs of pants. So based on that, how many outfits are possible? So the first thing we're going to do is mark out what he needs. So he needs a shirt. So let me use the space for a shirt. He needs a tie. And he needs a pair of pants. So in each spot, we're going to mark out how many possibilities there are. So he has six shirts, so there's six possibilities. He has two ties, and he has four pairs of pants. So the number of outfits that are possible is found by multiplying these together. This is called the fundamental theorem of counting. Anytime you have a sequence of events occurring, so a shirt and a tie and a pants, in order to figure out how many possibilities there are, we multiply these together. So multiplying this together, 6 times 2 is 12, times 4 is 48. So he has 48 possible outfits. Okay, in this next example, we have a quiz consisting of five multiple choice questions with four answer choices each. Now this same Bob decided to go on a date instead of studying. So what is the probability that without studying, he's going to get 100% on the quiz? So we're going to do the same thing again, just set up how many things you have. So if I have five multiple choice questions, I'm going to have five slots. Within each slot, I'm going to mark out how many possibilities there are. So each question has four answer choices, so each one is going to have four possibilities. Now these are going to be independent events because one question has nothing to do with the next question. If question one is A, question B can or question two can also be A. So everyone's going to have four answer choices. They don't depend on the questions. So again, just like in the first one there, if I have a sequence of events, so I have question one, two, three, four, and five, the problem or the number of possibilities is found by multiplying all of this together. So 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 times 4 is the same thing as 4 raised to the fifth. So multiplying that out, I'm getting 1,024. <clears throat> so there's 1,024 possible ways to answer these five questions. So the probability that you're going to get it right, so the probability of getting it 100% correct, there's only one way to do that, so 1 out of 1,024 possibilities. So if I divide 1 divided by, so 1 divided by 1, 24, that's a pretty small number. So this is about 0.000, I would say 977. Or if you want this as a percentage, moving two decimal places to the right, you're still not even at 1%, so 0.0977%. So the chance of giving everything right just by guessing is next to nothing. In this next example, let's say there's eight red marbles, four white marbles, and six green marbles in a bowl. What is the probability that you will select a red marble and then another red marble? Keep in mind that marbles do not go back in the bowl after each selection. So what we're looking for is the probability of getting a red and then another red. So we have two marbles, so that means we're going to have two spots for each marble. So let's figure out what the possibility is to get red. So of these marbles, eight of them are red. So for the first one, there's eight possibilities. Let's see how many marbles we have. So eight, four, and six are in the bowl. So I have 18 marbles in my bowl. Now since the marbles do not go back in after each selection, once I take that red one out, that red one is gone. So now there's only 7 left. And once I take that red one out, there's only 17 total marbles left. So this is an example of independent, or I'm sorry, dependent events, because one does depend on the next one. So by taking that red marble out, you affected the next probability. So these are dependent events. Now again, because we have a sequence occurring, so a red followed by another red, we're going to multiply those together. So multiplying across the top, we get 56. And then 18 times 17, we get 306. Okay, then I'm just dividing this out, so 56 divided by 306 is about 0.183. 
So we're looking at about an 18.3% chance that you'll get a red one followed up by another red one. Okay, let's look at one more example here. Let's say you are at a casino playing a game of craps. What is the probability that you roll a 7 or 11 two times in a row? Okay, so we want to get a 7 or an 11. So there's a couple, actually four ways that this can happen. So one possibility is that you get a 7 and then you get a 7. So that's a 7 or 11, twice. You could get a 7 and then you can get an 11. A third possibility is that maybe you get the 11 and then you get a 7. In these, all of these cases, you're still getting a 7 or an 11. And then the fourth way that you could do it is by getting an 11, followed by an 11. Okay, so in all of these cases, you're still getting a 7 or 11 two times in a row. So now let's go through and figure out the probability of getting a 7 and then getting a probability of 11. So the probability of 7 and the probability of getting an 11. Keep in mind that these are going to be independent rolls because one set of rolls or one set has nothing to do with the next. Once you roll a 7, you can roll a 7 again. Not going to affect. So now I'm going to go through and find the probability of getting a 7. So let's think of how that can be done. I actually have a whole table from a previous video of this. So the probability of getting a 7 could have been a 1 and a 6, a 2 and a 5, a 3 and a 4, a 4 and a 3, a 5 and a 2, a 6 and a 1. There's actually six ways to get a 7. And then to get an 11 could be a 5 and a 6, and a 6 and a 5. So there's two ways to get an 11. So to get a 7, there's six ways. And because you have two dice, there's six ways on each one, so 6 times 6 is 36. To get the 11, there's two ways out of 36. Okay, so if I want to get a 7 both times, that's going to be 6 out of 36 times 6 out of 36. Again, each roll is independent. If I want to get 7 followed by 11, that's going to be 6 out of 36 times 2 out of 36. If I want to get 11 first, that would be 2 out of 36, and then a 7 would be 6 out of 36. If I want to get 11 both times, that's 2 out of 36 for both. Again, because you have a sequence of events, you're going to multiply them together. Okay, so taking a look at what we have, 6 times 6 is 36. 36 times itself is 1296. 6 times 2 is 12. 2 times 6 is also 12, so that's actually the same thing. And then 2 times 2 is 4. Okay, so these are all the individual probabilities. So if I want one or the other, so this is an or statement, we're just going to add all of this up. So 36 plus the 12 plus the 12 plus the 4, there's 64 ways to do this out of the 1296. Okay, just added all those up. So then 64 divided by 1296, we're looking at a pretty small chance here. 0 0.049, about 4. Whereas a percentage, only about a 5% chance that you're going to get a 7 or an 11 two times in a row.